These guys realized quick if they were going to claim that cigarettes were not addictive, they better have proof. This is the man they rely on. He's been testing the link between nicotine and lung cancer for 30 years and hasn't found any conclusive results. The man's a genius. He could disprove gravity. This is called industry-funded research, and while it is a science, unfortunately, it's oftentimes a science of deception. When faced with inconvenient facts, companies will sometimes pay for research to find the opposite conclusion so they can deny guilt. The most notorious example for this was the tobacco industry, who famously created an organization called the Council for Tobacco Research to fight the idea that cigarettes caused lung cancer. Uh, Dr. Little, have any cancer-causing agents been identified in cigarettes? No, none uh, whatever, uh, either in cigarettes or in any uh, product of smoking as such. Now fast forward a few decades, the public eventually found out the truth and the CTR was exposed as a sham. But as the world turned its attention to new problems, one industry found itself in familiar crosshairs. We Americans spend more money on slots than on movies, baseball, and theme parks combined. But with the modern slot machines, there's a greater potential for a dangerous side effect, gambling addiction. Problem gambling has become an epidemic. Last year, the American Psychiatric Association reclassified pathological gambling as an addiction. Uh, Las Vegas and other casinos are like giant laboratories, and the features that earn higher will stick, and those that don't will drop away. The formula they've hit upon happens to be one that's highly addictive. The gambling industry was being accused of preying on the wallets of addicted gamblers, addicted gamblers that they helped create with their carefully designed machines. Howard Schaefer, a researcher at Harvard, noted this increased addictiveness of modern games like slots by calling them the crack cocaine of gambling. In the midst of all this horrible press, the gambling industry needed a strategy to stay alive. Luckily for them, they had watched someone else go through this and had learned a few things. You can't completely deny the facts. The cigarette industry tried it and it didn't work. The truth eventually comes out. So they came up with a different plan. Instead of denying gambling addiction, they would embrace the problem publicly and also take an extremely active role in researching the science of gambling addiction. By doing this, they could frame the discussion of the addiction the way they wanted to. And so the National Center for Responsible Gaming was created, funded by casino dollars. And here's how they describe gambling addiction today. So what exactly is a gambling disorder? And why do some people struggle with it while others do not? One point that research clearly shows is that gambling disorders are closely linked with other psychological problems, including depression and substance abuse. We also know that, over time, proximity to casinos does not impact the prevalence of gambling disorders. And while the vast majority of people gamble responsibly, approximately 1% of Americans are diagnosed with a gambling disorder. Now, it might not surprise you, many of their findings are in direct contradiction to scientific studies that aren't backed by casino dollars. But rather than nitpicking everything, I want to focus on their macro message. The biggest thing is that they want to imply that addicts are born that way. They're not created from a product. If you can blame addiction on brain problems within the addict, you're indirectly vindicating the gambling machines. Of course, this is what the casinos want. The most dangerous idea is that they have anything to do with creating addicts. So instead they say, it's not the product that causes the problem. The problem is already within the addict and just expresses itself in the addiction. The senior research director for the NCRG, Christine Riley, makes this bias explicit. Quote, things are not addictive, they're just not. If you don't have that vulnerability, the odds are you won't get addicted. And the NCRG is willing to put up a lot of money to any scientist who will agree with them. And surprisingly, one of the people who took them up on that offer was Howard Schaefer, the man quoted earlier as calling slots the crack cocaine of gambling. Today, he tells a much different story, that casino games like slots aren't addictive. And if this seems like a 180 to you, you're not the only one. When asked about this contradiction, he tried really hard to square the two opinions. But at one point, you said slot machines were the crack cocaine of gambling. I did say and, that. And how does that square with what you're telling me today? Not everybody who uses crack cocaine becomes addicted. Yeah, but nobody's going to sit here and try to tell me crack cocaine isn't addictive. And if this is like crack cocaine, the conclusion is that it's addictive. I, I don't come to the same conclusion because the majority of people that have used cocaine have not developed cocaine addiction. Only a small minority have. 
And the same would be true with gambling. Okay, now obviously Howard Schaefer would say the millions of dollars in research funding he's received hasn't tainted his research, but uh, in Schaefer's words... I, I don't come to the same conclusion. Because if he started to say the wrong things, a lot of that funding would disappear. Research funding from places like the NCRG, but also MGM Resorts and DraftKings, just to name a few. And this strategy to buy scientific research, to shift the burden of responsibility onto the addict and away from the product has been great for a casino's public image. But it isn't the first time someone tried it. Uh, certain of the published data uh, seem to show an association between certain types of cancer and excessive use of cigarettes. Now, we're very interested in finding out what kind of people are heavy smokers. Uh, is it a different nervous type of person? Is it a person who is reacting differently to strain or stress? Because it is very clear that certain people just can't, can't take it. Certain people just can't take it. This is exactly the same framing casinos use. Why do some people struggle with it while others do not? Certain people just can't, can't take it. It's a simple, powerful argument. And whether or not anyone fully believes them, that isn't the point. The gambling industry wins even if all they do is confuse you. If they can cast doubt on the scientific consensus of what causes gambling addiction, they've won. Because nobody's gonna legislate on something that the scientific community isn't agreed upon. And the problem of deliberate misinformation is widespread. It goes beyond just smoking and gambling. You can find it at Exxon, where knowledge of climate change was deliberately ignored. And you can find it in the sugar industry, when they paid for research to blame heart disease on fat instead of sugar. You can even find it in my favorite soda company, Coca-Cola, when they publicly said they care about the problem of soft drinks, but deny it in the science. So if we know this problem is widespread, why do we continue to fall for it? There are two main models we use to deal with research that has a conflict of interest. You can completely prohibit it, or you can disclose the conflict of interest and use peer review as a check and balance. For a long time, we've used the latter and assumed peer review would be enough because prohibition just seems extreme. But many critics are now wondering whether this is effective at keeping out bad science, because the NCRG disclosed it, and yet they still managed to shove 200 papers through the peer review process. Even the tobacco industry funded research that slipped favorable articles past the peer review process. In my view, the risk is too great. I think that more journals should seriously consider the prohibition model when dealing with papers with an obvious conflict of interest. We live in a world where the truth is not agreed upon very often. And the last thing we need is for science, a beacon of objectivity, to be cluttered by bad actors who just want to confuse the scientific consensus and prevent progress. So far, what are the conclusions reached by your organization? In my opinion, to single out smoking as a causal agent is on the evidence to date completely unjustified. Well, thank you very much, sir, for your help. Well, thank you very much for letting me put our views forward. You better have a cigarette before you go ahead. Thank you. Before you go, we have a sponsor, our very first sponsor. So thank you to Audible for sponsoring this video. You can get a free audiobook and 30-day trial by going to audible.com slash break or texting break to 500-500. Most of the ideas you see on this channel are inspired by books, and one of the ways I get through books is by listening to them in the car, at the gym, walking, whatever. Uh, it's a great way to just take some books down in your free time. Today, I wanted to recommend Hooked by Nir Eyal, which is about how people engineer addictive products. And I think it goes right in line with this video if you want to learn more. So once again, you can get a free audiobook like Hooked by Nir Eyal or any book that you choose from their amazing library by going to audible.com slash break or texting break to 500-500. Thanks for watching.